for RCR Wireless News. My name is Sean Kinney, and I'd like to thank you for joining our webinar today, which is titled Converging Towards 5G. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce our panelists who are going to be giving presentations throughout the webinar. Joining us today are Monica Paolini, president of Senza Feely, Ray Butler, the vice president of wireless network engineering for Comscope, Mike Coyado, who's Corning's marketing director for in-building wireless, and Derek Peterson, chief technology officer of Boingo Wireless. By way of uh, programming notes, we will make a recording of this session available following the webinar and distribute that to everyone who is registered. There's also an accompanying report that will be available for download later today. And you can, uh, throughout the webinar, use the portal to submit questions, which we will take following the presentation. So I encourage you to engage with the panelists we have today. So the idea here is to take a look at three tiers of convergence that are driving the evolution from LTE towards 5G. As we all know, 5G is not standardized yet. We're looking at a mid-2018 timeframe for the standalone 5G new radio specification. But the three main use cases have uh, already been established. Those are enhanced mobile broadband, massive support for the Internet of Things, and mission critical communications that depend on the ultra high capacity, ultra low latency that we're gonna expect from the 5G standard. So all that's a given at this point, but what do we need to do as an industry to get there? This is where the convergence piece comes into play. Uh, we're gonna need an ultra dense network, and by network, I mean a wired network and a wireless network. So that means more fiber, more fixed sites, more mobile sites. To add bandwidth, we're gonna need more spectrum. That's gonna include the licensed spectrum that we're familiar with, unlicensed spectrum, and shared spectrum. Some of the newer movements here are around shared access to the CBRS band, which the FCC seems to be moving on as of yesterday. And globally, that same band is seen as a 5G roaming band. We've also got multi-fire and five gigahertz, which is poised to support private networks. And then there's millimeter wave, which brings really high throughput, but it comes with some challenging propagation characteristics. Then there's this third tier of convergence. Uh, I find this one really interesting, and that's a convergence of the industry and all of its stakeholders. So given the complexity of these future networks and the business cases that come with them, and the potential multi-trillion dollar economic opportunity, this isn't anything that, that one company is gonna necessarily win out on. This is something that's gonna take a long-term collaborative effort. So when you take those, those three ideas of convergence and put them together, that's what we're gonna talk about on the webinar today, just this holistic idea of convergence towards 5G. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Monica Paolini from Senza Feely to share her perspective. Sean, thanks a lot for uh, inviting me here uh, on this webinar. It's a, it's a particular pleasure because it's all, all friends that uh, are participating today. We all known for, for quite a long time. So it's good to basically share notes uh, with, with each other. Um, so, uh, I will be talking about this, the shift from atomic to pervasive networks, and I will tell you in a little in a, in a second what what is this is about, and um, uh, and and why how is that moving to converge networks? So if you can go to the next slide, um, the, what I'm trying to do. I mean, we all know that. Uh, there is uh, an increasing uh, in uh, usage. Uh, everybody wants to use mobile networks, wireless networks. Uh, so there is a clear, uh, the networks are asked to do more, basically the same level of funding. Uh, so, but the, the, the issue is that we cannot just do more of the same to get more out of the network, our networks. We have to fundamentally use our networks to design and uh, operate them in a different way. And uh, this is where I, t when I talk about the, the move to pervasive networks for today's, uh, what I call them uh, atomic networks, is uh, uh, it's more than uh, the sum of the new technologies and uh, uh, the increase in demand uh, put together. Uh, it's, it's a, it's what, what I think it's emerging, it's a new way to think and operate more, um, 
wireless networks. So I'm going to start from that, then go and talk about convergence, and then eventually talk a little bit more about uh, what is that, what that requires in terms of transport, back and front home. So um, what's going on? Let's go back. Can you go back, back to the previous slide, please? Okay. So, um, so you. So there are diff different trends that are driving us towards pervasive networks and today networks are very well tested, they work very well, but they're not very dynamic and flexible. And uh, basically what we have is that different elements do different things. So you have one element, one thing, one cell, one area. Uh, everything is pretty much uh, uh, very stable, um, but doesn't really um, meet the, 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 the demand that we have out there. And instead, pervasive networks uh, are going to take us to um, uh, converge networks at different levels. Um, and that will, be, uh, will allow us to address uh, demand in a much more efficient way. Next slide, please. So this is what I mean by atomic and pervasive networks. So in the networks today, we have discrete RAN elements base stations cell, uh, cells and uh, uh, this is increasingly getting the, the that that this model is increasingly not um, being superseded by um, a model in which antenna and baseband are separate with the, um, the RAN virtualization. And eventually we might be getting to a situation where there are no more cells, no more cells in the sense of uh, uh, separate units, but they will all share, uh, there will be different antennas placed uh, in the environment uh, uh, providing ubiquitous coverage, but we don't have the same um, uh, this, you know, distinction. Uh, that, that those, those are the, the key atoms in the atomic models. Um, we will move from a single layer architecture to multi-layer architecture, and uh, capacity is no longer something that we decide, we define, but rather there, is, there are different capacity level depending on what you're trying to do. Um, so, um, and, and this is actually taking us to um, uh, um, KPIs like uh, uh, latency that are becoming much more important. And I would say uh, it's, uh, QOE becomes more important than KPIs themselves. So we need to understand what is the perceived performance rather than performance itself. And that has a lot of implications. Um, functionality in, a t in the today's network, it's based uh, to specific hardware units. In a virtualized function, everything is spread out, functionality is spread out across uh, 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 hardware and across locations. Uh, and location becomes much more important because depending on where you put function, you have a difference in uh, performance. So you can you see how everything becomes more fluid and uh, uh, more, um, uh, more dynamic. As a result, also the, the, the separation be co between core and RAN disappears, and the core and the RAN tend to get together. So you have on the one end, you have the, the RAN that becomes virtualized and so it moves towards a more um, a centralized type of architecture. And then the core with things like uh, mobile edge computing that move to the edge and therefore becomes more distributed. Um, User plane and control plane are no longer separate. They tend to get together. Um, uh, and um, uh, if the capacity is no longer measured in terms of a cell, what is the cell side? But is the capacity that really matters is the density, the density of capacity. How much capacity do you have on a square square mile, square feet, whatever, whatever your, your, um, um, uh, your, your unit is? Uh, next slide, please. So the, the diff and fundamentally the difference is that uh, today's networks, stomach networks are network centric. It's the subscriber that adapt to the network. So you go to the window if you don't have coverage indoors. Um, in the future, in a pervasive network, is the network that ad adapts to the subscriber demand. I am inside the building. I need coverage there. I'm not going to go to the to the window, and the network will figure out what's the best way to serve uh, my my requirements. And 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 be, in order to do that, the, you have to run networks in a different ways, and uh, it, it it has a lot of implications in terms of where you put the infrastructure. So there's much more of a indoor, and uh, um, 
the role of uh, uh, venue owners and different new, model, uh, new uh, models. Next slide, please. Um, okay, can we go next one again? This is for your reference. Next slide. Um, there are different technology enablers, and uh, Sean touch, touched uh, many of them, and they're listed here. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but uh, what that means is that uh, we are moving to a situation where uh, on the RAN there are multiple interfaces uh, and uh, NR with 5G, but then there is also Wi Fi and cellular. Uh, they, they're becoming, uh, instead of just coexisting, they're becoming more in, better integrated. And uh, there is a mutual dependency here in the sense that they, they need to work together to get, we need to have them work together to get the best out of them. Uh, so it's more than just uh, offload. Um, there is a, a license and unlicensed uh, with, uh, um, again, with Wi-Fi, but also uh, new models with like CBRS that allows uh, uh, um, operators and enterprises to use spectrum in, in, in a shared fashion. And uh, I talk about some of the other ones as well. So it's it's and the transition is going to be gradual. It's not we're not going to wait waiting for five G, uh, but we will continue with five G. Next slide. Um, so what what that means in terms of the converged networks is that uh, a lot of the dichotomies that we used to see uh, are, are basically uh, are fading away, and uh, in a world where we are seeing more and more uh, polarization, I think that in technology and in wireless, what we are seeing, and Sean uh, introduced that topic as well, is that we see the, the people recognize the need to move together in in a, in a common direction and the need to work together. Um, for different technologies, for different par partners uh, and uh, players in the ecosystem. And uh, I think that, uh, and, and here are five different directions in which this is happening. It, the networks are uh, no longer, there's no longer distributed or centralized, but there is a sense in which you need both. Wireless and wireline, same thing. The access is becoming wireless by default, but eventually it has everything has to go to wireline, and uh, and uh, the wireline part, the fiber part, is moving more closer and closer to the edge, and it. The, the crucial thing is how the two interact, not the fact it's one or the other. It's the interaction between the two. That's the, that's the convergence part. Same thing with fixed and mobile. Most usage is actually fixed, but you have to support both of them depending on where you are. And the question is, what's the best way to do it? Run and core, I just talked about uh, the, 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 the disappearing of a distinction between the two. Um, back hole and front hole, same thing with the um, uh, RAM virtualization we see that uh, there, there is uh, uh, there are there, and with functional splits there are situations which is no, not strictly back hole not front hole is the X hole is something in between the two and what that means is that operating a mobile network is no it's not really becoming like a utility which is what a lot of people uh, are afraid of because you know you just have the capacity but better performance but it's more like directing an or orchestra where everything is, uh, has to come together. And that makes the role of the operators much uh, more important and interesting. Next slide, please, final slide. And uh, so what that uh, means is that uh, uh, though a network like that, there is an increased uh, pressure on, on the front hall and back hall and transport in general, because I think that we run the risk of focusing too much on the RAN and then finding out at the end that uh, the, the, the transport is a bottleneck because the, the, the ability in the RAN to accommodate a lot of traffic needs to be uh, also addressed at the, at the further level. And that's, I think it's a, it's a crucial and that's what uh, we will be talking uh, today. That's all from me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation, Monica. And then now I'd like to uh, turn it over to Ray Butler from Comscope. Okay, thank you, Sean. Um, please advance the slide. So very happy to be here. Appreciate this opportunity to share our vision. So uh, converged networks are, are being driven by the need for more capacity or improved speed of deployment and for multi-service capability to reduce uh, expense and to uh, improve efficiencies. And these key network challenges are what are driving networks today, both 4G today and the evolution to 5G. 
and they need to be addressed to meet consumer demand in the most cost-effective way possible. So products, uh, product architectures are needed with flexibility. Uh, Monica talked about the need for flexibility, uh, which can be easily installed and maintained and improve this time to market that we talked about. Uh, fiber management solutions are needed, which scale flexibly in a cost-effective manner as the network grows to meet the demand. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So when we talk about wireline, we need to distinguish between the local wireline network and the long haul network. Uh, while the long haul network is fairly static and changes very little relatively, uh, except to add capacity and perhaps locations, the local network has a lot more change going on and uh, the trend is that will be even more change going forward. However, like the long haul network, the short, uh, the, the local access network needs to be based on fiber uh, and needs to be multi-use. Has to be able to have the ability to carry all different kinds of traffic to uh, many different locations. And as with all networks these days, the speed at which it can be rolled out is very important. Uh, time is money, so faster speed of deployment leads to quicker revenue and lower costs. Um, however, in the local network, uh, the network often tends, often needs to be more flexible um, as the timing, the location, the types of service are often difficult to predict. You know, one example might be a business service uh, showing where, showing up where it used to be residential. Uh, it could be new construction or a teardown might even be adding a small cell or macro site where there wasn't one before. And once there is a service need, it needs to be simple to connect this service. The key to having this flexibility is often having the right physical plant architecture. We've seen tremendous growth in putting access points in the outside plant with closures, hardened connectors, multi-fiber hardened connectors, all leading to making it faster and easier to turn up new services with less training and less opportunity for error. Um, some services, for example, might only need one fiber, such as residential uh, fiber to the home via GPON or business services uh, via NGPON2, while some services may require many more fibers, such as a uh, small cell or macro cell site. With that, let's, let's advance the slide, please. So global mobile data is projected to grow tenfold by 2021. At the same time, the average revenue per user, the ARPUs worldwide are flat or declining. So to meet this increasing data demand, networks are being densified, which means putting more capacity in a given geographic area where the hotspot of demand is. It's critical to do this in a cost-effective manner. So one of the key ways that densification is being addressed today is by the deployment of small cells. Deploying a small cell requires first acquiring the site, then bringing power and backhaul to the site, whether it's a pole, a rooftop, or a micro tower. Uh, and typically what we're seeing is that backhaul is fiber uh, for 4G and looking forward to 5G. So uh, de uh, deploying more dense networks that are cost efficient is also driving this path to CRAN, as we call it, centralized RAN with an end game of cloud RAN. Uh, some of our cloud RAN products, for example, are for outdoor cabinets and support centralized RAN today and enable cloud RAN in the future. So the most effective connectivity solution provider will have the entire picture um, from antennas, the RF path, the base site experience, to also include fiber management and connectivity solutions. Uh, Monica talked about the convergence of back call and front call and the move to the edge. So the uh, solutions provider that has the view of all of those, um, I think is best positioned because of that in-depth knowledge uh, to arrive at the best solution. We could please advance to the final slide. Thank you. So, what we're saying with this diagram is that convergence really applies to every area of the network, from the small cells to the central office, from the venues to the home enterprise to macro site. Um, everything we see on the diagram and more is, is involved with convergence. And the convergence of fiber connectivity can benefit this entire network 
and help customers have a better experience at lower cost to the operator. Um, the changes that our industry is going through right now as we evolve towards convergence uh, involve the technology, the products and processes, as we talked about, the architecture of the physical plant, and even organizational alignments uh, within the service provider community as well as the supplier community to help optimize resources and capabilities for deployment and operation of a converged network. Um, so the sharing of assets between wireline, wireless, and broadband infrastructure is at the heart of convergence, and Comscope is ideally and uniquely situated to bring situation, solutions that cost-effectively benefit the converged network. Thank you, Sean. Great, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. And uh, now if I could uh, turn it over to uh, Mike Coyado from uh, Corning. Yeah, Sean, thanks. And thanks for the introduction and the opportunity to present. And most importantly, thanks to everybody online who's taken time out of their busy schedules to join today's webinar. Um, as you may have picked up, we've had a, a change in presenters today. So for those who expected to hear from my colleague, Bill Kuhn, you're unfortunately stuck with me. Uh, however, I'm sure RCR will make arrangements to refund you if you asked. Um, but all kidding aside, I'm very energized to join these accomplished thought leaders to wrestle with the topic of convergence. Um, I think it's kind of fun to begin a presentation by asking the rhetorical question, is there a better time to be in the wireless industry? I mean, consider the vast opportunities afforded by innovation and initiatives like 5G and CBRS, the Internet of Things, uh, smart cities and smart buildings, autonomous cars, uh, artificial intelligence, analytics and big data. Uh, I could go on and on, cloud computing, uh, AR and VR. Um, but all of these things are informed by and inform our connected world. If you go to the next slide, please. I think enabling this connected world is a task that's both enticing and daunting. And I observe two key trends. First is the trend of more, specifically more devices. And I'm not talking about just handsets. I'm talking also about more data creation, more data storage, and more data traffic, uh, all of which I think presents five primary problems to overcome. And those include network connectivity, security, managing bandwidth, future applications and sustainability, and of course, controlling costs. Uh, the second trend I observe is the trend of the blurring of lines between, let's call it church and state, meaning with the need to interoperate with existing networking assets, infrastructure, and systems, wireless and wireline, outdoors and indoors, license and unlicensed spectrum are moving inextricably together. Uh, and so new problems require new thinking. And as an innovator and market leader, Corning thrives on solving difficult problems. Next slide, please. Our vision for enabling the connected world and addressing the two trends that I have showcased is based on a strategy of wire at once, enable many, which contrasts with the traditional approach of single purpose, single purpose, uh, single purpose, single technology which is both limiting and capital intensive. Wire at once enable many is predicated upon a network infrastructure of fiber deep to the edge and convergence of multiple networking services and applications on this foundational infrastructure platform or backbone to create short-term and long-term value outcomes that make both technical and business sense. Fibers paramount for enabling our connected world, both today and for the future, because it delivers benefits such as long-term infrastructure, virtually unlimited capacity, the ability to overcome distance limitations, a small and light footprint, and simplifying the addition of new types of services. And convergence leverages fiber infrastructure to support multiple networking services and applications, including wireless and wireline. For example, an operator may use outdoor assets to deliver a mix of residential, business, wireless backhaul and front haul and other services, um, which is informed by 
Verizon uh, recently this year uh, doing a, a $1 billion plus fiber deal with, with Corning to build out the fiber network to be able to deliver that. Um, also indoors, an enterprise may use this uh, backbone to deliver a mix of LAN and cellular and Wi-Fi and building management systems, point of sales, uh, security, IPTV, and many other types of services. Next slide, please. Convergence generates CapEx and OpEx savings, as well as really one of my favorites, what I like to call non-technology benefits as a result of a technology benefit. For example, uh, such as gaining back leasable space in a building because of a strategy of fiber and convergence has now reduced the physical footprint of gear. Uh, to steal a riff from Kenny Chesney, that's the good stuff. So to answer my rhetorical question of, is there a better time to be in the wireless industry? Uh, the answer is, it's a great time to be in the wireless industry. And given the challenges and opportunities of enabling our connected world, which, will be, which we believe will be addressed through a combination of fiber and convergence via this wire at once enable many strategy, it's also good to be corny. Uh, so I look forward to hearing from the other presenters and getting into the Q&A interactive discussion. And once again, thanks for your interest and attention. All right, thank you very much, Mike. And now uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Derek Peterson, the uh, Chief Technology Officer for Boingo Wireless. And it's great to be here again as everybody shared uh, and uh, great to see a lot of attendees here. Um, and uh, it's always fun to be last because a lot of the stuff that uh, is shared, I I'm nodding and agreeing with. So, uh, so it ends up making it easier for me to share some of my thoughts. So, so uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of the things that you know we've been uh, doing at Boingo over the years is we uh, over the last years really trying to push this idea that uh, networks of the future really require this convergence that everybody's talking about. We released a, a manifesto in February of this year, really calling for uh, a rally cry across the industry to recognize that, as shared by others, the immersiveness of content. Uh, is and the removal of the borders between the digital and physical worlds that we we live in has really re requires us to change the way we think about deploying and setting up our networks. You know, I always think about how we set up networks today, and in, in this convergence 1.0, we still do it, where we set up borders, we're creating cells, and we're trying to make sure that these interference and borders are established, and we have borders uh, across the network, but we also have borders across the industry uh, where one group or another, whether it's the handset manufacturers, the network manufacturers, the service providers, or anybody in the ecosystem, uh, has these borders that they establish uh, amongst each other. And it's really, for us and for me, when I think about trying to deliver an economical and uh, practical solution for 5G, it's removing all the borders that we, we see today. And one of the great uh, opportunities we have in doing so is this advantage that was already talked about with big data. As we uh, are able to share uh, more and more of our data with each other, and you can go to the next slide, um, as we share more and more of our, our data with each other, um, what's going to happen is we're going to be able to, instead of having borders set up so that we can, we don't worry, we have to worry about data going from one border to the other, or setting up these borders, we remove those uh, borders and we end up allowing ourselves to share the data across those borders. If you think about what's happened in, for example, the security areas where we used to always set up these firewalls and you, you were very protective with your firewalls, that same change where we're now, instead of setting up firewalls and actually looking at that data and having that data make us aware of security issues, that's the same kind of changes that we're going on, are going on and need to go on in, in our industry when it comes to the data that's uh, available in the networks. And one of the important things about that is this whole idea of unlicensed. As we know, unlicensed, 
in its nature has had to deal with this idea that you have to share, that you have this data flowing across that you need to be aware of and you have to do these, uh, take these steps to make sure that you have that flexibility. And that's why unlicensed is, is so important, uh, not only from a technology perspective, but also from an, uh, the way you look at unlicensed to really enable and allow that flexibility and that enhancement of the connectivity um, by taking down those borders and recognizing that there's value in, in sharing. Usually when you have a device connect uh, in a Wi-Fi environment, all the devices are talking to each other and sharing with each other where they're at, which access point to connect to and all of that. Instead of having a default control plane that's really administrating it, you're letting everybody and all that data share and and in, with new advances in, that are coming out, that data is really going to drive the networks. And so I think that that's a key point. You can kind of read through the slide some of the other ideas, but really uh, Wi-Fi or unlicensed technology is going to be a key part that's going to give us more uh, ability to have that flexibility across the network. Go ahead and go to the next slide. When when we think then about the unified design and we start looking at these borders coming down between licensed and shared licensed and unlicensed, it, we have the opportunity to really take advantage of all spectrum because we're sharing that data elements with each other uh, and with the network and across the network. And it ends up realizing that we want more in the wireless landscape, we want more spectrum. And so we're going to have to go to unique new areas to find that spectrum. Each spectrum uh, that we use has different characteristics. Those are both technical as well as uh, uh, physics related or physical. And we have to uh, deal with those and recognize the value that each one of the different types of spectrum has. When you deal, for example, with millimeter wave and some of the stuff that's coming down with 5G and R and, and taking advantage of that. We know that uh, millimeter wave has great capacity for giving us higher speed, and but yet we deal with uh, issues and use cases where it doesn't go for long distances or because of interference problems. By combining millimeter wave with mid-band or with low band technologies, you now end up really being able to create both an inner uh, network and outer networks as shared in some of the slides earlier. It all becomes one overall reaching network instead of a bunch of small cells that are separated. Next slide, please. So when we look towards the future of convergence, there's a lot of names that are thrown out. We've talked about some of them here, like CBRS and Multifire. You know, we still have all the, the different LTE uh, variants with LTU, LAA, and, and you know, adva even advanced air LTE with carrier aggregation. All of these things are coming together to really just create an opportunity for us to share. And, and that, that's really what convergence is about. It's about trying to have the opportunity to not only share in the RAN area, but also in the, in the fiber as shared. I love the view that uh, was showed where I only have to run, run fiber instead of having a bunch of uh, cables, you know, in a venue. So those are the kinds of things that are really going to drive the convergence in the future. So if we go to the, the last slide, I think I'm on. One of the things that uh, was shared by Sean was this idea that we've got to not only uh, think about the technology that we're changing, but also the way we work uh, with each other and with the way service providers or traditional MNOs today work with venues. As we start moving and changing our technology, we also have to change our business models. The venues and the locations that we go to want to take advantage of that same rich data set that's coming uh, from the venue and that interaction between the digital and physical world. And so they're willing and their will uh, be participate in paying for um, some of the infrastructure that needs needs to be installed inside their venue to be able to get access to that information that will allow them to pro provide and tear down the borders between the digital and the physical world. 
And so in order to do that, we have to find a solution that allows us to share that data in secure ways with each other. And then allowing also to leverage existing infrastructure that's already there so that we can take advantage of the densification. And as shared, we want speed and, and time to market. So leveraging existing infrastructure is very key uh, to bringing about 5G. And of course, we need to reduce the cost as shared and, and on neutral host advantages and trying to create those relationships between venues, uh, traditional carriers, and some of these non-traditional carrier models is going to be key. So that said, that's, that's what I have. I appreciate again uh, being there and I'll turn it back over to Sean. All right, thank you very much, Derek. We've, uh, we've got a lot of great questions that have uh, come in during the session, so we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, uh, first off, uh, Monica, I'd love to get your, your kind of broad perspective on this question that we got, and that is, what does 5G and convergence have to offer to operators in terms of increasing ARPU? You know, basically, what, what's in it for the operators? Ha, huh, increasing our pool. Uh, that's that's a tough one. Um, so if you if you think of our pool and monet, uh, monetization in general as uh, being able to to, to you know to, to add a five dollar charge or you know to the bill, I don't think, especially in the U.S. market, uh, that that's just not going to happen. You cannot charge people more. I mean, your subscribers more for that. Um, but what what I think that the, the increased revenues are going to come from primarily are for new applications and new use cases like uh, uh, IoT um, and uh, the ability to work with enterprises to um, uh, to have uh, private networks. So it's a, it's a different type of services that go beyond uh, uh, ARPU. So I think that monet the, the opportunity for monetization comes from um, thinking beyond the ARPU of uh, the, what currently is are the, the predominant users of the service that you know individual subscribers like you and me um, so I think that, that that's really where the opportunity li lies and that's where we you need to have networks that are really well tuned to take advantage of those opportunities and that's where 5g is going to be great at all right and then Derek you touched on this uh, a little bit in your presentation but I, I'd love to hear from uh, Ray and Mike uh, in response to one of these questions I know this is a subject that both of your companies wrestle with regularly but uh, viewer wants to know about the channel to market for enterprise cellular who's gonna fund it which entity is going to enable it and and what are some of the pitfalls that you guys are working to address in terms of uh, that capital expenditure going from the operator over to the enterprise? Uh, Mike, could you uh, start us off? Yeah, sure. It's a, a timely question. You know, obviously the overall trend has been that the operators are retreating from funding uh, a lot of these in-building networks and so it's uh, imperative that if the enterprise or venue wants the amenity uh, now considered a utility um, that they need to step up. Um, you know, generally, uh, you know, this is a, I, I think this is about uh, sharing costs and um, whether it's the venue owner and let's, you know, go back in, in time. You know, when I started in the in-building wireless space, uh, it, it wasn't the carriers or the operators that fully funded the network. There was there was sharing, um, and so uh, you know the it's it's more about you know the technology exists to uh, develop essentially the the four things that you need to get into a building if the operator is not going to bring a signal right? right. So you know signal sources exist. Um, they're relatively cost effective. You need to enable uh, multi-operator support and enable business models or uh, or funding models and so i think you know a sharing model works um, potentially there are third-party uh, models that work to fund it um, but uh, i think that that you know per perhaps maybe the greatest barrier right now uh, for for moving more swiftly downstream into some of the smaller buildings like hotels and office buildings a lot of it is, is, is about pain and until the the pain gets uh, acute enough 
then uh, you know a lot of the a lot of the buildings will will remain without without coverage, but a desire. And Ray, could you maybe uh, uh, share uh, Comscope's perspective on on really how to drive cellular into the enterprise given the different market dynamics that we're seeing right now? Yeah, definitely. We're also seeing the shift from uh, operator funded to also include uh, enterprise funded. Um, I think one of the keys uh, as we get into these, um, you know, shifting from maybe the very large venues to some of the medium or smaller venues, uh, I think uh, a couple of things are, are going to be important. Um, one of those is going to be the architecture of the product uh, that's that's deployed in the building. If it's multi-operator, then DES is is typically a, a clear winner from a, you know from a sharing perspective. Um, if it's single operator, then um, you know, I think an architecture where it's easy to deploy, it's uh, flexible, kind of self-optimizing, I think it'll be very key to uh, reducing the cost of installation, reducing the cost of optimization, deployment, and maintenance of, uh, of the system. So I think those are going to be some very key considerations of how to, how to simplify that product, simplify its um, its deployment, its optimization, and uh, make it very easy for the customer to deploy. The enterprise uh, building owners and managers are not going to be typically experts on uh, on wireless, so you know I see it as a as a coexistence with Wi-Fi and. Uh, something that uh, I think the architecture is going to be a key part of to drive the cost. Really, what it really is going to come down to is cost per square foot, uh, all in. You know, totally uh, planned, installed, and uh, and optimized. Right, and and Derek, to take a little different tact on the same question of of getting cellular into the enterprise. Uh, you know, Boingo is heavily involved in in CBRS and multi fire. So take us through the outlook for using shared or unlicensed spectrum to enable a private network for a particular enterprise or industrial use case. Yeah, I think one of the, one of the key things I'll, I'll just say to add to that and then I'll, I'll get into the question is uh, when, when, when you're putting in a network, you're trying to get something out of it, right? That's why we put it in networks. We, so understanding the services that you're deploying for, for inside of a venue are key. And then enabling those services and, and having the ability to enable those future services is also very important. So when we talk about cellular networks, a lot of the times when we're talking about cellular networks, we're talking specifically about the operator's need or the individual's need with that operator to be able to use um, that network. What we have to recognize is, is when we're talking to enterprises, we need to, instead of talking about the needs of the operator, of me to have that signal for that operator so I can make a phone call, which is the traditional stuff, we need to get into those other services that are gonna be available because they can do that. They can make sales calls. We can end up having our, our web conferences like we're doing here. You know, I'm, I'm in a Bucharest right now and I'm on a, a web conference doing this through Wi-Fi, right? Uh, and, and having this uh, chat through Wi-Fi today uh, because the DAS network will probably or the network here in, in this building that I'm in isn't strong enough to do that. So we need to look at those things and we need to model our networks to be able to support what's going on inside those venues and, and, and the sharing that's happening there. And so once we do that, and we've recognized that, then we get into these great opportunities to start taking advantage of different technologies in, in the sharing. And that's where we get into CBRS and multi-fire. Traditionally, our sharing has always been, uh, okay, everybody bring in a DAS network, everybody bring their own baseband, and then we're only sharing in this, in this similar uh, um, infrastructure. So the cabling, the, the network, the power, uh, you know, that, that wired network. Now with multi-fire and, and CBRS, we're gonna be able to also share in the spectrum and we're going to be able to meet new needs there so that I don't have to deploy four or five different baselines to be able to support every carrier. We're gonna end up being able to do things like 
LTE roaming in the future, just like we're able to do Wi-Fi roaming with, with Passpoint today. And when that world comes, there's going to be new models that come out and for the business to help pay for it as well. So the venue is going to be participating and getting people online. And there's going to have to be some kind of roaming relationships that are going to end up changing. And I think that that's another great thing that's going to happen. When I look at our office, for example, at Boingo, and I know I'm talking a bit long here, we don't have wired. I used to have a PBX. We got rid of the PBX. We're all wireless now. And so we have uh, LTE deployed in our office from all the carriers, as well as through small cells, as well as Wi-Fi. And so you can be on either one of these networks and connect and make calls. And in the future, companies want to have that flexibility to build that kind of network. And they can have that by installing uh, small cells or DAS systems from existing carrier uh, spectrum, or they can take advantage of shared spectrum or unlicensed spectrum and reduce that cost that we've all talked about trying to reduce. All right. Well, thank you for that, Derek. And then uh, thank you for joining us at 10 o'clock at night. I didn't realize you were in Romania, so I certainly appreciate <laughs> that. Now, uh, this is a question I'd like to uh, pose to everyone. This comes from one of our viewers. And just to set the stage here, uh, a lot of the pre-standard 5G trial networks that we're seeing set up in the U.S., particularly from AT&T or Verizon, are focusing on this fixed wireless access use case uh, using millimeter wave spectrum. So uh, what our viewer wants to know is, does 5G eliminate the need for fiber to the home. So uh, Monica, maybe you could weigh in on that, then we'll take it around the horn. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's a question that I, I see a lot. And I think that um, um, the way I would answer is that, again, it's, it's really, a, it, it makes sense because it's a convergence play here. And so there are situations where um, getting fiber directly to the home, it, it's, uh, it can be difficult, expensive, or, downright impossible um, and so what millimeter wave does is to expand the reach of fiber to areas where fiber is just not uh, available but you still you still need uh, uh, this high uh, this huge pipe that is not going to be using uh, you know traditional cellular um, spectrum um, and, and so what that does, on one hand, it allows us to use millimeter wave spectrum that has been you know, out there and available for a long time within a network where it's better integrated to provide this, to support these new use cases in a cost-effective way. Uh, but that doesn't limit in any way the fact that, eliminate the way, the need that we have to have fiber to the home. In fact, we need more of that because once you get to the home, uh, you have a much higher demand in terms of uh, uh, capacity, latency, um, because we have more devices. So we have more wireless devices in the home and they might be using even a, a millimeter wave uh, for, for access. Um, and so we, the demands from the home as if you take it as, as a unit, are growing very fast because we're no longer you know, constrained to our uh, phone or uh, uh, laptop. We have many more devices. Uh, so there is an increased need for fiber, but then also millimeter wave gives you the opportunity to reach those households where um, the fiber is, is not available. So I think it's a, it's a win-win situation where they're both needed. Ray, maybe you could weigh in on that. I mean, fiber deep is, is going to be key to delivering 5G, but uh, what's the relationship between building out a deep fiber network and then augmenting it with uh, 5G fixed wireless access? Yeah, I think, Sean. I definitely see them as complementary uh, solutions. I think there will be cases where it uh, really makes sense to do you know, 5G via millimeter wave. Um, and then there will be places, uh, you know, where fiber to the home is, is the right answer. And it's going to come down to uh, density of users. And uh, we may even see millimeter wave deployed as a stopgap while, um, uh, you know, while fiber is brought in. Uh, I think it'll, you know, there are a number of, of factors in this business case. Um, 
what, what we do see is a lot of the trials today are being done with 5GTF, but uh, almost universally uh, we expect that that will migrate to 5GNR as soon as the standard is uh, available and, uh, and uh, the radio systems can be upgraded. And I think part of the rationale there is that those same sites, if you will, that are going to serve uh, fixed wireless users could also be used to serve mobility users. And I think that's where the business case is strongest for those for those sites is where it's a, a dual dual service, um, both fixed and mobility. So again, definitely see it as complementary. And depending on the very you know specific geography and the uh, uh, you know, fiber availability in the area, uh, it could be an end game solution for fixed wireless, and it could be a stopgap as fiber is brought in. Mike, what's your take on that? I, I know I mentioned what Verizon is doing with 5G fixed wireless access, testing it out in uh, 11 cities around the country, but at the same time, they're spending 1.1 billion with Corning for fiber over the next three years. So uh, uh, what's, the, what's the sort of uh, convergence point, if you'll pardon that horrible pun, between fiber and millimeter wave fixed access? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're selling a bunch of fiber, uh, both fiber to the home and, and for 5G deployment. So I, I think that uh, just maybe a different way to respond, uh, but along the same lines is you know, there's, there's not a single, you know, there's not a silver bullet. And it, it's kind of akin to, I remember uh, being on a panel with Dr. Derek a few years ago where, uh, you know, different different focus was on, uh, you know, DAS versus small cells. And, you know, Dr. Derek made the observation, this is, this is that proverbial uh, Beatles or the Stones debate. And, you know, the, 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 the truth, you know, or the, the, the lesson learned was, you know, why not the, the Beatles and the Stones and Janice and Jimmy? And so, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, um, I think it's both. It depends on, um, it de really depends upon on the, the scenario and the, the technical and business merits. But I think you can make the case for both. I don't see one eliminating the other, no. Right, no. Dr. Derek, this is uh, one I, I wanted to, to pose to you. You mentioned it in your presentation, but uh, you quite literally wrote a, a manifesto about convergence back in February. And uh, included in that was the network piece, the spectrum piece, but then also the sort of uh, industry collaborative piece. To that last point, can you uh, just give us a little uh, insight into what was driving your thinking about that need to work collaboratively that you went to the, the extent to publish a manifesto about it? And how's that been received now that it's been out there for a few months? Yeah, I, I, you know, I think... Uh, it all started probably about four years ago when I was sitting in a, in a meeting in China and with a, a bunch of sea level people. We were talking about 2020, and I know it's it's coming up. It's only a couple of years away. And I remember us, uh, and I remember trying to understand what we were doing at Boingo and uh, realizing we were drawing borders to allow people on in the way we set up our retail. Um, you ended up having to buy a plan to be able to get onto the internet and you had to pay, you know, it was our retail play and, and recognizing that Wi-Fi was going free and that I couldn't, fo I shouldn't be focusing on the 3% of the people that were going to pay on Wi-Fi. We had to find new models to be able to get people on and get the 100% of the people on or 90% of the people on when they go to our venue. And so we had to stop um creating those barriers and, and i think that that's really what i realized then and we made some changes to the way we thought about getting people online it was about finding ways to make it so that we can still make money maybe in a different way through advertising or through relationships with carriers and, and wi-fi offloading and and and, and pass point and, and all of those different things and it required a change of thinking and i think that that's what we're going through now on the cellular side, that same thing we went through on the Wi-Fi side or experience on the Wi-Fi side, we're now going through it again. And that's going to require all of us to start saying, hey, I don't mind a neutral host or enterprise participating in 
understanding what's going on with this uh, network and providing them some of that data to make it rich for them because they're also going to be part of paying for it and establishing that connection that those people need. And then we're going to get more and more immersive content out of it, which is going to end up driving more usage and then find new ways to be able to uh, find uh, money. Because at the end of the end, we're all running businesses that are looking to find opportunities to make money and a border and securing a border to try to make money it may work for a short time it doesn't work in the long run and so you need to be able to establish that freedom and find those opportunities by not being afraid of of tearing down certain walls Right. And then um, I think we have time for one more, maybe two more questions here. But uh, Monica, I wanted to circle back to your presentation. Um, you talked a little bit about the difference between a cell centric network and a user centric network. That, that term user centric network, I, I think that's come out of the China Mobile Research Institute and Dr. Chi Lin Yi there. But can you expound a little bit of, on what a user centric network is and, and how it's delivered technologically? Yeah, that that comes from uh, the the China Mobile Research has been. Uh, I found it very you know uh, very intriguing and insightful. Uh, but at the same time, it, you know you hear the same the same concept coming not just uh, uh, from China Mobile but uh, um, uh, from Chile but others as well in in Europe. Uh, uh, possibly more so in the U.S. Uh, a lot of vendors are actually working in that direction too. And I think that uh, uh, there is a realization that, I mean, the, the sort of the old school model is that we build a network and then uh, try to do the best we can and that's it. Uh, and, and now the, the question is how to, to have a network that works for what we are trying to do. So think about changing the network uh, in terms uh, or uh, having a network architecture that molds on to what is that we're trying to do with it. Uh, and so it's a fundamentally different perspective. Which is why, you know, from a network point of view, it makes sense to have a, a discrete cells out there because that's uh, uh, that from a network point of view, that makes uh, eminent sense. From a user perspective, uh, the network is, is everywhere. So uh, th th that those boundaries are often a problem when you say so when you move from one to the other, you have a handoff and things like that. Obviously, from a user, you don't see that. Um, but it's 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 a very different way to 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 think about the network and then plan and the. What is different now uh, from the past is that we have the technology tools that allows us to do that. So, for instance, with you know uh, having small cell multi-layer networks, uh, virtualization, um, especially virtualization in the RAM, uh, it, that allows us to actually do that. So, the, I think that the the, the 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 confluence of those two elements it's uh, it, it's key in, in driving this change. Right, and then we, we might go just slightly long here, but I wanted to get in one more question to uh, to Mike and Ray. Uh, I, I just got back from the Cable Tech Expo up in Denver, uh, Comscope and Corning, both well represented there. One of the predominant talking points was how cable operators or MSOs can leverage their hybrid fiber coax plant to either enter the wireless market or better support incumbent wireless players so i'd like to hear from both of you going forward how do you see the cable industry using their assets to evolve with the wireless space uh, mike maybe you can start us off yeah i'll, I'll be be pretty uh brief about it I, you know one of the words that i like to to use is uh is is a hybrid it's it's cooperation uh, you know, essentially cooperating and, and competition. And so I think when you when you meld those things, and Dr. Derek was was really, I think, you know, highlighting that, showcasing that in the manifesto, is that, uh, you know, you're, you're going to need new, you know, new problems required new thinking. And so, uh, you know, additional uh, segments of the ecosystem that have, you um, fiber assets in order to enable our connected world, I think that that makes sense. Cooperation. 
I like that. And, and Ray, maybe you can um, close this out here by giving us uh, your take on uh, what the role of these HFC plants is going to be for wireless or for converged networks as we uh, go forward towards 5G. Okay, thanks, Sean. I'd be happy to. Uh, so when we talk about deploying sites, we talk about PBS, right? Power, backhaul, and site acquisition. So you think about the cable plant, right? The cable TV plant, the strand, uh, you, you, you really have an opportunity there for all three. Um, by virtue of the right away, they have the site act, if you will, if you hang the small cell on the, on the strand. Um, clearly there's power and backhaul available. So it's a, it's, it's a unique opportunity to uh, kind of help solve this densification problem or uh, conversely to, to deploy you know, an entirely new network. So I think there is a world of opportunity um, present with the, with the uh, MSOs and uh, that, that they are very well situated to address what we view as the key, uh, you know, the PB and S uh, challenges with site deployment. All right. Well, I, we've already run a little long, so I, I apologize to the folks watching us that we're not going to be able to get to all of your questions, but I, I really appreciate you joining the webinar and all of the uh, engagement that you've brought with it. And uh, certainly a big thank you to our panelists. And just a quick reminder, this webinar is going to be available to watch on YouTube later today, and we'll also distribute uh, the report that uh, accompanies it, which will be available for download. So thank you again for joining us.